internet, the psychologist's casual review, and today we're going to be reviewing Psychoanalysis, the Impossible Profession by Janet Malcolm. So this book is a treasure trove of so many ideas and so many interesting um, premises that um, I feel that it's worth reviewing on this channel. So it was written by Janet Malcolm, who isn't an analyst, nor a psychologist, nor a psychotherapist. She doesn't come from the field at all, she's a journalist. However, in this book she does an in-depth investigation on what is psychoanalysis, the institutions, the profession, and the patients. Of course, all of this is covered with anonymity, that means that basically people don't know who is who, but uh, she did a very thorough effort to do the research. And so what I found so interesting is that, first and foremost, even though she's not uh, trained as an analyst, she understands re really well the concepts that she implies, how it works, what are the um, ins and outs. For example, she understands transference, she defines it. Everything is defined within the book. And what I found very interesting is that it is defined according to Freud and even people after Freud. So, for example, when she talks about transference, she was going to talk about how Freud discovered it with the Dora case and how he started treating hysterical patients. So, she is really in-depth. And she's even at the, like, at the cutting edge of psychoanalysis of the 80s, of course, because the book is written there. Because she talks about the controversies between Otto Kernberg and Coit, which is basically very modern at the time, and how she interviews one psychoanalysis that she names Aaron Green. Aaron Green is, of course, uh, a name that she chose. It's not the real name of this analysis. And I felt that her interviews with him were very eye-opening. Because Aaron Green is basically uh, your one of the male psychoanalysis. I'm not saying that he's not original, but he's really the man that told the line and that um, is invested in the institution and takes at heart the tenets of the ins psychoanalytic institution and the psychoanalytic dogma. So what I found so so basically interesting in the book is basically she's going to um, put the theory of psychoanalysis in a sort of test, meaning that she's going to explain to the reader the theory and then she's going to ask Aaron Green about it and other analysts. However, Aaron Green is the main one that we're going to see throughout this book, as he's basically the um, central character, even though it's an interview and it's not, he, he's not a character, he's a real person. And with him are going to appear the flaws, failings and also the assets of analysis. So, as I stated earlier, Aaron Green is a very uh, by-the-books analysis, meaning that he's about Freud and Freud only. Like, he says at very early in the book that basically he feels that Klein is an heresy, uh, Kernberg, Kuhut, um Fernburn, Guntrip, Winnicott, all of that is basically trash to Green, which he, Green feels that, Aaron Green, of course, feels that all of that dismisses the fundamentals of Freud. For him, psychoanalysis is hard, it's joyless, it's tough both on analyst and on analysand, and that it's not a fun experience. It's basically just converting neurotic suffering into standard suffering, and even then, like, it doesn't even seem standard suffering, it just seems even more suffering. And there's something very strange about how Aaron Green, at least to me, uh, at the psychotherapeutic level, explains psychoanalysis, because he explains that there's basically a trade-off, but not necessarily a good trade-off. Like, it's very nebulous, and... There's that strange, strange idea that basically psychoanalysis would not even be very helpful. That it's just a, a something that helps the patient go forward, but brings him back and can be incredibly destructive. And it's so interesting, because for me, it doesn't represent that at all. And I felt wondering in the book, like, is he even happy to be an analyst, really? I mean... It seems that he's in two minds about it, because he also seems to imply in the book 
that he's kind of self-centered and he kind of feels that analysis is like surgery. So to an extent, it was the same metaphor Freud gave. So it's not, I can say, exceptional. It's not he, just his idea. But it seems so cold. I mean, in the book, he, he equates it to really surgical analysis. And basically, it's about how the, the analysis can cut deep and give meaning and interpretations that there is no real fundamental feelings. If there is a feeling, it just needs to be analyzed by the analysis to the patient. It seems that the true relationship is something not just to be wary of, but even fearful of, like there's a distance. There's, if it exists, it exists almost as a byproduct, a secondary effect, let's have medication on an illness. It's basically something that normally I felt was antiquated. I even saw that it was antiquated in the 80s, right? So I really felt that it brought me back, like really reading the book and really reading the testimony of Aaron Green was something like, a, I really thought we, we, were, we were beyond that, right? Because there is that kind of wariness in the book of like, if patients make progress, are happy with themselves, then that's a bad thing for analysis because they're not going to want to go deeper. They're not going to want to heal from their childhood problems. I found that ludicrous. Like, my God, I mean... It's necessary. It's not an inconvenience. And these people treat it as inconvenience. There's also a whole point in the book on how psychoanalytic institutions are completely guarded. Our refusal to go into the future and forward with new ideas. And there's even at the t- um, point in the book, which is very interesting because I had reviewed a couple of weeks ago um, the 30 ways of destroying the analyst's creativity in which Kernberg says that you should only invite people from other schools of thought, only to rip them apart in public. And in this book, that's exactly what happens. Like, there's a point where one of the analysis that Malcolm is interviewing um, gets into a fight, a uh, discourse with Kernberg, and says, yeah, I crushed him. And you're like, oh my God, I mean... So basically, that's where we're at. We're at the point where, at least in the 80s, and for the New York psychoanalytic analytic institutions, it's dogma, dogma 100%. It's like there's a line and it needs to be followed drastically with this strange fear that if it's not followed, then things are going to get out of control and everything's going to spiral to hell and that basically psychoanalysis would be lost, which is incredibly strange when you really think about it because... What they are advocating for is a Freudian basic level of understanding, which is, even in by the 80s, like, when you think about it, it's just preposterous. And the fact that they don't take any, anyone else into real account, except the pure Freudians, right, meaning people who only follow Freud, seems to me to be a complete and utter mistake at, on every level, theoretical, patient-wise, even clinically. <laughs> It seems to me to be one of the worst case scenarios. And the worst is they're proud of it. Like, I mean, that's a badge of honor. I mean, you ha- you're you climbing, you're just a heretic. You're, you're when you caught you, like, get out of my sight. For them, there's a strange belief that Freudian psychoanalysis, like real, true, orthodox Freudian, is where it's at. Like... It's a true understanding of the patient. It's hard, difficult, painful. Very painful, from what I understand. But it's the truth. Whereas the other ways of seeing things are just derivative and they impose meaning on the patient rather than understanding. What they say is that the other ones have already a foregone conclusion before even the start of psychoanalysis. Oh, it's due to this, due to that, due to this. And to be completely real with you, I really felt that it was basically so projective on the Freudians to think that others have a foregone conclusion because Freudians also have a foregone conclusion that everything is linked to the Oedipal complex, right? So it's not as if they were going a virgin of all beliefs or all theoretical understanding. So that made me kind of like very critical of the position of Aaron Green. So there are other people, but all of them seem to be in the same vibe. 
of Freudian orthodoxy, a vibe that what I like is that Jan Malcolm like challenges it. She doesn't like take it as a standard, oh yeah, well that's the that's the truth, that's the reality. She goes in deep in the arguments and counter arguments, and you can feel that she's there's a back and forth between her and Aaron Green on a lot of topics. Mainly the fact of termination of analysis, which is a very interesting thing because it seems to be a the there seems to be some kind of unfork about an unsinkable process in ending analysis. And, like, she tries to challenge it, and he says, well, there's no real formal ending, but uh, it just ends. And there seems to be so much resentment on analysts of that school with whom patients end. Like, I mean, as if they're ripped off, in a way. And that's something that I found quite... Um, despicable to be honest uh, and all of that I mean you can really feel that like she portrays and like I talk about the psychoanalytic institutes of New York in the 80s right since might have changed I don't know them never worked with them so they might be very different now but at the time where this was written is that there is just the right way of doing it and the wrong way the right way is Freud the wrong way is everyone else and this is um, backed many times by Aaron Green and how he dismisses all the others as just all cult leaders or basically people that misunderstand everything and charlatans. And that's, I feel, like the worst threat there is to psychoanalysis. It's its rigidity and its will to impose a certain viewpoint. And as soon as you stray from that, you're, you're, you're to be kicked out, or at least marginalized within the institutions. And also, there's a whole point of the analytic institutions and how the elders of that institution are going to maintain power and are going to veto any younglings, let's say, even if, as Aaron, said, said, Aaron himself says in the book, you're young in your 40s and 50s, in those institutions, obviously. So it's something to be considered. And there's also a whole um, subtext of superiority, at least compared to us Europeans. Because in America, for a long time, if you did not know, oh, psychoanalysis could only be performed by doctors, medical doctors. Uh, of course, psychiatrists, but also GPs. But those were the two things. Lay analysis, were, meaning people that were not doctors, medical doctors were incredibly, incredibly rare, if not absent. And they kept it that way for a very, very long time. And there's that aura of superiority. Yeah, we, we are medical doctors. We know best. We are the cream of the cream, not like those Europeans that are kind of below tier and accepted anyone. As though being, not being a doctor is somewhat of an insult. As I stated, very dogmatic and not even Freudian because Freud was against that dogmatic uh, viewpoint himself. So you can really see that like it's also a power game in terms of the institutions and how they function and how in a way Aaron Green is trying to go up the echelons but also faring to go up the echelons because as he goes up he understands that these institutions are like everyone else. You kind of get married to the job and he's very ambivalent towards that level of dedication, both personal and professional. So there's a whole interesting point. There's also how the question of money, which is very interesting because it's taken into the book and how it's writes. And Malcolm seems to challenge very subtly that idea that um, analysis should be expensive. But then when she challenges it, they kind of hide behind Freud and Freud's argument for it. So there's that very interesting, like, double standards. Like, when it suits them, they're going to use Freud as a shield and as a sword. But when it doesn't, they're going to ditch it. Like, for example, that idea of, um, as I stated earlier, of lay analysis. Also, the, the, the ideas of Freud on um, how to handle sins. So you kind of see that it's when it suits them, right? Which is very interesting. And the only thing I think I fundamentally agree with Aaron Green is how, in a way, even though analysis gives insight and 
allows for a better understanding. Analysts themselves, be it psychiatrists or even laymen, are not beyond humanity, beyond their flaws. They might understand it, but as he said, very rightly so, you take them out of the consultation room, they become like everyone else. They're not better because of analysis. They're not grander. They're not humans beyond human. They are fundamentally human, and he's no exception. What I can grant him is him being incredibly honest towards... uh, Janet Malcolm and her questions and her investigation. So that was very appreciable. But fundamentally, I could not disagree more with Aaron Green, his vision of psychoanalysis, which is directly inherited from Freud. And I think that we've moved on also. Not to say that there's nothing interesting, but there's also some things that have been better. And I think that... um, at least in the book, the institution and Aaron Green are quick to dismiss those movements towards um, a more modern approach. So that was my take on the book. Very good book, and I would fundamentally recommend it. If you're anywhere interested in the ideas of psychoanalysis and are somewhat of a beginner, great book. She explains everything, and there's also a challenging point of view. So that's going to be it for, for today. So I'll see you in the next one, and if you ever want to ask anything, please feel free to do so in the comments.